Hello, BookTube. All right, we're back at part two of our October Q&A, and we're starting off with Bill Rutenberg. <laughs> oh, God, here's trouble. All right, Steve, here goes. What was your favorite bookish place to travel to outside of the United States? Do you think you will ever do any more traveling around the United States, specifically to a hidden gem called Iowa? <laughs> uh the, the most bookish place I've traveled outside the United States would probably be Ham on Y, because it's made to be that way. But I didn't care about such things. I, when I was traveling, I was not involved in the book world in any way. I was not, I was not caring at all about new releases or prowling through old barrows of books. Not at all. I had a set number of books with me, and they were my companions. It was deadly. It would have been deadly for me to try to add books to my luggage. <laughs> so I never did. I didn't do it at all. I figured if, I, if you give yourself a little inch, you're going to take a mile. So just turn off that part of your brain and turn it back on when you get back to the States. Uh, but what was the the next question? Do you think you will ever do any more traveling? No. Not except in short bursts. No. Uh, and specifically to a hidden gem called Iowa, I very nearly did. I very nearly transplanted myself to Iowa. This was... Oh, what was it? About 10 years ago? 10, 10 years ago? Thereabouts? I had an old friend who lived in Johnston, Iowa, uh, which is much closer to Des Moines than, than uh, you are. <laughs> and and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a stereotypical, lovely Iowa suburb town. Uh, I guess you could call it a bedroom community of the bigger city. Uh, totally friendly people. Uh, totally friendly everything, <laughs> totally friendly everything all the time. And I was down to the point of carefully planning the logistics of that move, of moving to Johnston, Iowa for the rest of my life. I was just planning on that. I was wondering what I could do to work. Most of, of the stuff that I do to earn any kind of money is not connected to any place, so I could do it just with an internet connection. I uh, uh, was I was looking into bus routes and local libraries and literary shops and whatnot, all that sort of thing. Now, that didn't work. That Those plans didn't go through. That would have been a massive commitment. If I'd made that commitment, I would not have been able to unmake it anytime soon, not without a huge amount of trouble. It would have, keep in mind, it would have involved moving two sick geriatric dogs all the way, a thousand miles to the Midwest. Uh, and I, I, it didn't happen, but it almost did. <laughs> so, But that was the closest that I've ever come in the last 30 years, and it's the, the closest that I ever will come. Uh, boy, though, I miss it. <laughs> I really do. Uh, let's see here. Arthur O'Dell says, in another video, uh, while discussing Dan Simmons' The Terror, you called it Intelligent Horror. Yes, I bought a, a ratty old trade paperback copy of Dan Simmons' The Terror uh, at a Goodwill, because Vin at Revenant Reads told me to. Uh, but the book was in such terrible shape. I thought I'd read, you know, maybe the first 70 pages, something like that, see if maybe I want to read the whole thing all at once. And it fell apart. The book fell apart even in the first 70 pages, so I, it didn't last long. Uh, I was wondering what other authors or titles you would also consider to be intelligent horror. I'm no connoisseur. Uh, but my, my suspects would be the usual ones. Uh, Clive Barker, uh, Peter Straub, uh, authors like that. I've read everything they've written and was ne I never felt uh, condescended to. I never felt like, you know, like I was reading the equivalent of a jump scare. Uh, so I, I would certainly recommend those too. Uh, Chris Day has a barrage of questions. Uh, number one, you've talked in some of your videos about a selection of books that you were that you took traveling with you, and which formed a permanent layer in your bag. Which books did you take? Yeah, as I just mentioned, those was a, a, a fake mosaic uh, on the bottom of my uh, my travel chest, which is out in the other room, and it, they, the books were perfectly set up size wise so that they made a mosaic on the bottom of that chest that when I tamped down the last book would not move. You could you could shake the chest upside down and those books would not move. And that made it very convenient for traveling. And that was that was carefully planned. Because there was always one book that wasn't in that mosaic. There was always one book that I had with me. I wasn't going to dig through my luggage if I had a, a delay. Travel was mostly delays. <laughs> so I, I always had one book with me. But as to the exact inventory, well, that's a cause of much speculation. Uh, Number two, what are your thoughts on Ian McEwan's novels, and do you have a favorite? Again, I, my choice here would be predictable. I think his novels are largely weak, and my favorite would be everybody's favorite, Atonement. I, I think Atonement was, in some parts, not weak. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a very strong endorsement, but that's the best I can do. Uh, number three, what are your thoughts on Bernard Cornwell's novels, and how does he compare to other prominent modern authors of historical fiction? I think he's really good. 
I think he should slow down, concentrate, write less. I think it shows sometimes when he is just stretching words over a page. And that's a bad habit to get into. Because once you get into that habit, you start to rely on those paychecks. And you shouldn't do it. He doesn't need it. I'd be willing to bet he doesn't need it. I'd be willing to bet he could take two years off from writing. And if he could, I think he should. Uh, but I like his books. I don't, I've never read anything by him I didn't like. Uh, Peter Esposito says, Do you have any thoughts about how a bunch of previously thought lost manuscripts of Celine were recently found? Do you think about this author in general? Also, could you cause, if you could cause one lost literary work of them all to, in, from all of history to be found, which would it be? I think it's a fascinating story. It's bound to keep happening, right? The world is, uh, it's bound to keep happening. And not just with relatively recent authors, but with ancient authors too. And of course, my, my answer to the last question is an ancient author. I would like all of Livy. His great work, the work that he wrote for his whole life, Ab Urbe Condita, from the founding of the city. We have only a fraction of it. It's a healthy size fraction. It, it takes a lot of space to reprint Livy, but I would like the whole thing. He'd be my first, just per, on a personal level, because I would love to read that. Uh, let's see. Tomorrow's Classic has a barrage of questions. Uh, number one, which is the best biography of Einstein? I like the Ronald Clark biography better than the Walter Isaacson one. The Walter Isaacson one is the one that everybody recommends, but I think Ronald Clark is a little bit better, a little bit stronger on the science. Not that that is a deal breaker, right? Because Einstein was understanding the science better than anybody except uh, a couple of other people in the world. So no biographer is going to understand it the way he did. But even so, that means a lot, I think, in a biography of a scientist. The more the biographer understands the science, the better. And I, I, liked, I like Clark's dealings with that more. Uh, number two, do you think procedurally generated stories written by AI will ever become an accepted part of the book market? Perhaps in YA first. <laughs> you trying to get me in trouble here? Uh, the, the sassy answer would be that YA is so incredibly strictly controlled by the censors that we have given power over our lives that it might as well be procedurally written AI. If you have, if you are, if you are on Twitter, first of all, 10 hours a day, so when the hell are you doing your writing? If you're on Twitter 10 hours a day signaling your identity and saying that your the story that you're working on is going to be intensely representative of that identity and advertising the fact that you have not one, not two, not 30, but 40 sensitivity readers that you, you hired at $400 an hour, an Inuit sensitivity reader, even though you have no Inuits in your story, just because if you didn't do that, they'd call you a racist. It, it, the book that comes out of a process like that is going to be a procedurally written, AI-driven thing. It's, it's not going to have anything of you in it. And that sensibility has crept into uh, what we now call literary fiction almost entirely. Literary fiction authors, especially white men, go about in terror. There are one or two anointed exceptions, one or two people that, are, that seem to have just slipped into the old establishment ways. You write a, a precocious collection of short stories, you write an ambitious, uh, slender, intensely autobiographical, navel-gazing first novel, you get the royal treatment, in other words, a prominent, favorable review in the New York Times Book Review, and you go on to be just a regular, accepted author on the landscape. That used to be the norm. Now I can think of two people that that applies to. And everybody else walks in terror every minute of every day of being canceled uh, for the next thing that they write. So I, 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 the sassy answer here would be that we already live in a world where the, the books that you're reading might as well have been generated by a politically correct AI. Uh, but it, in, in terms of will it ever become accepted, are we 100% sure that it hasn't happened? I'm not 100% sure that it hasn't happened. A lot of these, these white hat hackers seem to me to be the type that would create an algorithm or a, an, inter, an interconnecting latticework of algorithms designed to write a book and then market it, pitch it to a publisher, get the whole thing done when none of it is real, when a human didn't write it. I'd be willing to bet that time will say that that has already happened. Uh, I don't have um, any objection to it, provided the AI has talent. <laughs> but uh, uh, it wouldn't take much talent to have more talent than most of the people writing literary fiction today. <laughs> uh, Let's see here. What, what, you had a bunch of questions, yes? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, number three. What's up with George Lucas's neck? I have no idea. Uh, number four. Thoughts on the four Chinese classics. Well, that doesn't work in a QA. and a You're asking me my, thought, my thoughts on a, on a book that's been around for a thousand years and has, uh, that I've probably read multiple times. I'm not going to be able to say anything more than, I liked it. <laughs> uh, 
I've read Journey to the West, and I'm reading Penguin's Story of the Stone. Uh, which do you like best? I like the one one that Penguin hasn't, to my knowledge, ever done, the water margin. Uh, there's a really pretty, there used to be a really pretty trade paperback from Tuttle here in America of the water margin uh, that they might still make. Um, it's it's the one that I like that Penguin I don't think has ever done. Uh, let's see here. Richard Kuatli. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're fine. Number one, human beings throughout history that you admire the most and the reason why they deserve said admiration and your respect. Is that a question? <laughs> it's not phrased as a question. And of course, I can't give a list of the human beings that I've admired throughout history. I mean, that these aren't Q&A type questions, right? That list would include Madame Curie and Miss Sainted Ma. <laughs> One of the reasons that I tend to admire people in history is if they show uh, non-physical, non-military courage of some kind or other. That that uh, uh, courage for their beliefs when their beliefs are good. Uh, but that's I know unhelpfully general. But I can't I can't give a list of every single human being I've ever admired. Well, let's let's move on to the next one. Uh, number two, Huizinga's biography of Erasmus was wonderful. Thank you for that. Any equivalents for Thomas More and Machiavelli that you can recommend? Well, for Thomas More, yes, I would recommend R.W. Chambers. Really, really good biography. <laughs> really well done. I don't know if Chambers is in print, but his biography of More is amazingly good. Uh, and for Machiavelli, Alexander Lee wrote a big book about Machiavelli, His Life and Times, that is very good. Uh, that will certainly work. It, it's not quite as thrilling as Chambers. Chambers' biography really raised to an art form. Uh, but also for Machiavelli, I would also recommend a Machiavelli book. It's not, it's not strictly speaking a biography. I mean, Rich Roder wrote a book called Man of the Renaissance, and his Machiavelli chapters are incredible. They're amazingly good. But the book I'm thinking of is by Sebastian de Gracia, and it's called Machiavelli in Hell. And it's tremendous. It's a bit acid trippy, but it's tremendous. It's like no quite. It's not quite like any biography that I've ever read, uh, but it is a brilliant tribute to the complexity of this figure. So I, I might recommend that. I not. I wouldn't recommend it in the same way as I recommend the Chambers or the Lee, which are more standard soup to nuts biographies. Uh, uh, do you have another question? Listening to you talk and sometimes rant is a pleasure that I took for, look forward to every day. Oh, thank you. Oh, why? Well, thank you. That's very nice. Although I should point out what I always point out in these Q&As, which is that I get at least as much pleasure out of talking to you as you get listening to me, believe me. Uh, let's see. DDB says, question number one. I'd like to try something from Harry Turtle, though. He's written a ton of books, though. What series or standalone novels of his would you recommend? I uh, understand the feeling. He's pretty good across the board, but I would recommend Guns of the South. Uh, a novel of his that uh, in in which a crate of modern day repeating modern technology rifles ends up in the possession of Robert E. Lee's forces in the American Civil War. Uh, I think it's just I mean it's tremendously readable. All of Harry Turtle Love is, but it's also incredibly thought provoking. Well done. Uh, and also, I have the same question regarding David Drake. Uh, I mentioned this the other day. I found a copy of his his Arthurian book, Dragon Lord is a good place to start because it doesn't sprawl on forever and ever and ever. His, a lot of his series sprawl on forever. If you read Dragon Lord or Killer or Ranks of Bronze by David, Bra David Drake uh, or Sea of Venus, and you really like them, you really like what he's doing, well, then you have endless series to go. He's still going strong, and he doesn't. his quality has not dropped. So the question would be, you know, read a couple of those standalones. Read, read Killer or... Uh, or Ranks of Bronze, or Dragon Lord, and if you really like that, then you're going to love the series. Um, Stephen Gentry says, I believe I've heard you discuss translations of both the Iliad and the Odyssey, which brought a question to mind. Do you have favorite translations or ones you find more readable for the Aeneid, Beowulf, and the Poetic Edda? Uh, well, for the Aeneid, I would, I of course, have a dog in the, in the fight for the Aeneid, but I'm not going to name anybody from centuries ago. <laughs> Instead, I will just say Alan Mandelbaum. Alan Mandelbaum's Aeneid is really, really good. Uh, for Beowulf, I would, of course, say Shea Heaney, Seamus Heaney. Uh, I mean, his translation is virtually unavoidable, but it's also very, very good. Uh, and for the poetic editor, I would recommend Carolyn Larrington. I think her translation was taken up by Oxford World Classics, but it's it's very good, very knowing, especially if you can get, you know, the introduction and the notes and all that sort of stuff. She's very good on the poetic editor. Uh, Isaiah Armstrong has a barrage of questions. Number one, have you ever considered self-publishing an ebook? As an ebook, some of your novels, like Troy War, and how is your autobiography coming? I have indeed considered self-publishing ebooks. 
Uh, but self-publishing my novels is a mugs game. I have come to the conclusion, I have seen the light, that the way for me to become a squintillionaire through self-publishing is to publish a self-help manual, <laughs> is to publish a life guide. And that is exactly what I intend to do. The Donna Huguenot Way, coming soon to an e-bookstore near you. Five dollars a copy with a, ha a select handful of physical copies that I will sign for you with a picture of Frida tipped in. The Donna Huguenot Way, coming soon to you. Uh, but novels? <laughs> uh, number two, I've watched and rewatched your Weston Cannon Starter Kit videos countless times. Uh, would you be interested in doing a more advanced one for intermediates? Maybe. Yes. Yes. I meant to do that months ago. I've been meaning that was a project for 2020 and for 2021. I just haven't got around to it. But yes, I mean to do uh, a Western Canon sophomore year. That, that sort of thing. I mean to do that. I, I, I doubt that I will do it in 2021. Uh, so it'll have to wait. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm not dismissing the idea at all. I, I very much want to do that. Uh, I've heard from so many people who don't watch my channel, who just found those videos because they're trying to grapple with this stuff. Not just students either. Plenty of people, uh, the, those videos were aimed not at students, but at adults who think they need to go back to school in order to read this stuff. The adults who think this sort of thing, this half of, the, no, they don't care about that, but the, the adults who think that this half of the background here is too intimidating for them to read on their own without a college professor to help them. That's insane. And a lot of those people have gotten in touch with me over the years and said, please do more of these. So I, I mean to do that. Uh, and then number three, will you be making any videos for Proustober this month? You must have mistaken that. You must have misheard me. It can happen, right? I make lots of videos in a day and you're very busy. You, of course, mean Proust Bember. The event of us reading Remembrance of Things Past altogether uh, was Proust Bember. It wasn't Proustober. I, I, it was always intended for November, so we don't have to worry about it for a while. <laughs> let's just move right on, shall we? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Vine Ayilavarapu says, number one, where do I start with Robert Louis Stevenson's novels? I've been reading and enjoying his short stories. I like how he carefully crafts the atmosphere. And number two, where do I start with Walter Scott's novels? Wikipedia says that he inspired RLS. I want to make that, I want to make that connection. Um, I would start with famous books from both of them. Get the taste first, rather than take anybody's prescription for it. Left to your own devices out in the wild, the first Robert Louis Stevenson you would probably read would either be Treasure Island or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Start with either one of those. That's just fine. Same thing with Sir Walter Scott. Left to your own devices out in the wild, you would almost certainly encounter Ivanhoe. So read Ivanhoe uh, and just go from there. Uh, let's see here. Toastwig says, do you write down everything you read or have some sort of tracking at all? If if not, in addition, how in the world do you make your end-of-the-year lists, which I'm eagerly awaiting. Yes, my end-of-the-year lists are coming. They are coming. Uh, I make notes per month, uh, not just for myself, but also uh, for wide behind-the-scenes consumption. Let's just put it that way. Uh, there are a number of people in the bookish world, publishers, editors, lots of reviewers, that kind of look forward to uh, an email breakdown <laughs> for me not only of, you know, the landscape of the upcoming month, what what's a big thing and why, what's interesting and why, but also a breakdown of the stuff from that month that I've already read, that they haven't read, what warrants attention. So I, I do that anyway, regularly throughout the year. Uh, uh, let's see here. Nick Piccarilli says, number one, how do you do review blurbs work? Do you get contacted ahead of time or are publishers free to just take any quotes they want and you have to discover it on your own. Well, those are the two ways that it happens. By far the most common way is that you write a review for some venue. Uh, the publicist connected with the book, part of their job is to harvest good reviews for the paperback and for the website of the hardcover. So they will go through and read those reviews. There are a lot of aggregator sites, uh, like the Muckrack, that will aggregate those reviews for them. Uh, so that it's, you, you get, I show up on sites like that all the time. Uh, open Letters shows up like uh, like that all the time because that's where the people at those aggregator sites know they can find me. Uh, publish, publicists assemble those together and then pick out the things that they think will work best. That's by far the most common way. And they don't notify you, of course. So you have to just go into a bookstore and tell for yourself. And it's a thrill. 
It never gets old. Uh, an old friend of mine and I used to go into, when he would visit Boston, we would go into uh, the Harvard Bookstore. Uh, not the Harvard Coop, but the Harvard Bookstore over in Cambridge. It's a huge new release section, books all carefully laid out. And we would just go through and look for our own blurbs and each other's blurbs on all these things. And even then, it's a, probably a small fraction of what's out there uh, that you're never going to know about. And then I, 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 that happens to me on this channel all the time where someone, one of you, will say, hey, they'll send me a picture and say, well, did you know you're blurbed on this? And I had no idea. And the other way, the first way that you mentioned is much rarer. And that's for a publisher to reach out to you and say, we would like to send you this book for a cover blurb. Uh, that almost never happens to me. It's only happened two or three times. It's always a thrill. But as I've mentioned many times on this channel, even though I review lots and lots of books and have for a very long time, I'm not a marquee name at all, like some other reviewers that I could name. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a bigger name at all. So it doesn't happen to me regularly. Uh, I imagine if I, if I had written a bunch of novels or even a bunch of critical works, I'd get a lot more of those. But I, as it is, I'm always happy when it does happen. Uh, uh, let's see here. Number two, you've mentioned your love of New Yorker cartoons. Do you have any other favorite cartoons or comic strips other than the New Yorker? Sure. Lots and lots of them. Yeah, Doonesbury, of course, Calvin and Hobbes. What is better than Calvin and Hobbes? And lots of others, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but uh, nothing for me quite quite matches old New Yorker cartoon collections. Uh, Haas says, uh, I have just one question for you. Are there any books relating to literary criticism that you think made you a better book reviewer? Yes. <laughs> yeah, all of them do. I know that's a facile answer, but I have a floor-to-ceiling bookcase in the other room that's all collections of book reviews. And when I go through there, I learn a lot, not just about the book under review, the specific book by that reviewer, but also about how to do things. I'm looking at the review from 1930 or 1960, and I'm thinking, okay, so you had very little space here. Look what you did in this space. Very interesting. I wonder if that's duplicatable in some way. I learn that all the time. Every time I go to that bookcase, I end up spending half an hour until until a certain little bean starts huffing over on the fainting couch because she wants me to rejoin her. <laughs> but I spend lots of time at that bookcase, and I learn all the time. Uh, well, let's see here. Sean Graham says, you mentioned the West Wing several times recently. What's your favorite character? Mine is definitely CJ. The pedant in me wants to say, of course, the question should be, who's your favorite character? <laughs> but but the, the pedantry <laughs> and also the New England background and the fact that I read and speak Latin and the fact that my favorite movie is The Lion in Winter uh, should probably give you a hint as to who my favorite character is. Of course, it's Jed Bartlett. Uh, although I'm, I can't 100% vouch for uh, Martin Sheen's production, for his pronunciation of Latin in that great scene where he's chewing out God in the National Cathedral. <laughs> That's That scene is uh, just fantastic television, but I was wincing a little <laughs> at some of the of the pronunciation. Although I know the machine was probably heavily coached. He's conscientious in that way, but I uh, you can tell, uh, let's say, a deep knowledge of Spanish coming through in some of that pronunciation, which may or may not be right. Uh, let's see here. Anch says, I have often heard you talk about how all humans are inherently violent. A human child will kill an insect or a frog as soon as they get their hands on it. Yes. And they will also want to kill all insects and all frogs. It's not just murder, it's genocide. Uh, they can't do it, but they would if they could. And they would think it was really funny. Uh, I would like to study more into this theory. Any book slash video slash vlog recommendations? Well, uh, not specifically, no. I mean, all of human history shows this very, very, very clearly. I... I, <laughs> I I wouldn't know how to specify. Uh, to me, it seems as self-evident as a sunrise. Uh, I'm sure that there are books on the subject. I don't think I've ever encountered one. To me, it just seems obvious. Having been having been raised and socialized by a species that wasn't human, it sticks out like a sore thumb when you start to see, when you start to look at humans, you see, okay, there's something wrong with this species. It's not just that they're violent. There are plenty of species that are violent. Warthogs. Crocodiles are violent. It's that they're genocidal. They don't just want to kill this animal for the meal that will last them for two days or two months. They want to kill every example of that animal. Because the wanting to kill is part of their uh, a mistake, a drop, a dropped stitch in their genetic code that no other animal on Earth shares. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see here. 
Uh, oh, you have another question here? Also, stop your hate against invoices. Some of us have to touch invoices to earn a living. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just, the idea for, for a pampered professional book reviewer, the very idea that anyone would ask me to pay for a book is just so... <laughs> I'll try to be more mindful. Uh, how are we doing for time? All right, we'll do a little more time here. Uh, Beatrice Mendes has two questions. Number one, how long is the typical long walk of the day for, with Frida? How long is the short ones? Well, things are different now, right? Things are different in a way that I didn't foresee even last year. It never occurred to me that Boston would simply drop a season. But it's 75 degrees today. It's it, I don't have the date in front of me, but it's it's going on the end of October. It's 75 degrees, 79, 80% humidity. It's been that way for 200 days. And, uh, we were we are well into autumn now, and it is still summer. It is still shorts, sandals, and shirt sleeves weather. Windows wide open all night long weather. Uh, and it's clear to me, no matter what meteorologists say, and no matter what pretty computer generated graphics they show, that that is not in fact going to change. And that puts a limit on what Frida is very sensitive to heat, and she's not aware of how sensitive she is. So she'll just plow along until she keels over, and I don't want her to do that. But typically. Our longer walks happen now uh, in the gloaming. They happen right as the turnover of sunset and right as the turnover of dawn, rather than in the heat of the day. It amazes me still. It still feels surreal to me. I've had a month now to get used to it. It still feels surreal to me to be talking about the, the prohibitive heat of the day in October. But there's no denying reality, so, so I am. And so the longer walks, we used to take a, a really long walk out in the woods for an hour uh, in the middle of the day to, to split up the day. I always I always sort of make our walks. I mean, she, we can go whenever she asks. If she wants to go outside, then we go outside. My answer is yes, no matter what. Uh, but if she, if she doesn't want to do that, if she's content to hang out, she still need, it's still good for her to do it. And it's good for me as well. So I will always make the going on a walk sort of the dividing line of some task that I'm doing. If I'm doing a review or a list or something like that, if I'm doing something, uh, I will say, all right, I'm going to get this done, and then we're going to go on a walk. Uh, and typically, the middle of the day is when we would take a long walk, an hour, even two hours, if, it, if the weather's really nice. The only, the only caveat I put here is that the weather isn't ever going to be really nice here again. <laughs> so, so the shorter walks are, are much shorter. They're 20 minutes. Uh, walk first thing in the morning. She can't go forever without going to the bathroom, and she hates getting up in the morning. So the mornings are a bit of a struggle, and the the, the the other walks are basically glorified bathroom breaks. They're never very short. I, I do not agree at all with giving a dog a very short walk, and you can guess what I think about just putting your dogs out in a yard and never taking them on walks. <laughs> you can guess what I think about that. The the amount of time if that were done to you. The amount of time that you would need to have memorized every single blade of grass and find this just mind-numbingly dull is exactly the same amount of time your dog needs to reach the exact same state. They just don't have English to complain about it. That's all. Uh, but uh, does that answer the question? The longer ones tend to be an hour. The shorter ones tend to be around 20 minutes. Uh, and number two, which translation of War and Peace do you recommend? I hope we can have a read-along soon. Uh, I would recommend Rosemary Edmonds. She, she and Constance Garnett are kind of my go-tos. Uh, Pepe and Rolkonsky do uh, very interesting things in their massive war and peace. It's actually on this bookcase behind me, yeah, right here, right next to Dante. Uh, but so are other war and peace translations as well. I, they, they they do interesting things. But I, as far as I'm concerned, they're not beginner war and peace. Because you can't have a taste or a, or a comfort with the interesting things they do. Because Tol Tolstoy is a weird writer. It doesn't come through in... Rosemary Edmonds or Constance Garnett, and that's why they have their critics, because the critics say, well, Tolstoy is a weird author, and it's not coming through in your translation, so your translation must not be good. Uh, but as usually I say, you're going to love Tolstoy's weirdness, but you're going to be put off by it if it's the only thing you get. <laughs> you First, you should get the story. First, you should get the stuff that he's doing that's not weird. The immense power of his narrative his narrative storytelling ability, his character draw drawing ability, is not weird. And it's immensely powerful, and it comes through loud and clear in Rosemary Edmonds or Constance Garnett. So I would, those are my favorites. Uh, let's see here. How are we doing for time? Uh, we, we'll stop after... Our next question is Jordan Parsons. We'll, we'll stop after him. 
Of all the writing you have done, reviews, fiction, etc., do you have any particular favorite pieces? No individual favorite pieces. No, there have been way, way too many of those. In terms of longer works, my favorite thing is still Troy War, the novel that I wrote about the Trojan War. Even though it, or maybe because it reads nothing like anything else that I wrote, uh, that I ever have written, or that I would ever write on my own. I still don't understand the genesis of Troy War. It is incredibly violent. It's in, incredibly disturbing. Uh, in, it's it's even the touching moments are touching in ways that are like the ways I usually write touching moments. Not I felt I know it's a cliche in the writing world. Authors say it all the time, and I scoff at them. But I literally did feel when I was writing Troy War like I was getting out of the way of something that was just coming through me onto the page. I literally did feel that way on subway platforms on the way to work or whatever. I would have a, a notebook open in front of me, and suddenly it would be ha half an hour later. Uh, and then the pages would be just covered with stuff. Uh, I'm going to say Troy War, and I'm going to wrap this up, so we'll go on to the next one.